Our Old Testament reading today comes from the 31st, 31st chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, the first through the eighth verse. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Then Moses said these words to all Israel, telling them, I'm 120 years old today. I can't move around well anymore. Plus, the Lord has already told me you won't cross the Jordan River. But the Lord your God, he's the one who will cross over before you. He's the one who will destroy these nations before you so that you can displace them. Joshua too will cross over before you just like the Lord indicated. The Lord will do to these enemies the same thing he did to the Amorite kings of Sihon and Og and to their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will lay them out before you and you will do exactly what the command I've given you dictates. Be strong, be fearless. Don't be afraid and don't be scared by your enemies because the Lord your God is the one who marches with you. He won't let you down. He won't abandon you. Then Moses called, called Joshua and with all of Israel watching said to him, be strong and fearless because you are the one who will lead this people to the land the Lord swore to give their ancestors to give to them. You are the one who will divide up the land for them. But the Lord, the Lord is the one marching before you. He is the one who will be with you. He won't let you down. He won't abandon you. So don't be afraid or scared. My friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have come to believe that one of the great, great theological texts of our time resides within the musical Hamilton. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. If you're not familiar with the musical, have no fear. I like history, and therefore I'm going to give you a history and a musical lesson. The musical Hamilton, written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, is a creative interpretation and, and understanding of Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. And in that show, there's a song called One Last Time. One Last Time depicts the conversation between George Washington in his second term as president and his Treasury Secretary, Hamilton, when he informs Alexander Hamilton that he will not seek a third term. When Hamilton receives this news, well, he freaks out. I mean, he really starts to lose it. He argues with Washington about why he must serve, why the people need him to serve. And finally, Hamilton lets go of the rational arguments and just lets his feelings out and says, why do you have to say goodbye? Washington replies plainly, if I say goodbye, the nation learns to move on. It outlives me when I'm gone. Like the scripture says, Everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. They'll be safe in this nation we've made. I want to sit under my own vine and fig tree, a moment alone in the shade, at home in this nation we've made, one last time. With these words, Washington shares what was on his heart, was that it was time for him to move on. It was time for the nation to move on, and it was time for transition. Ah, transition. The process by which we move from what we understand to be normal into what will then be normal. Transition is one of those things that happens in our personal lives and in our institutional lives as well. My wife and I are at the interesting stage in which we are actually fairly stable, but literally everyone around us is not. We have two kids, and just this last month, we went to high school on the horizon for our youngest. And last night, we were sitting talking about at what point do we move on and sell our house. Add to that the fact that in the last two years, we have said goodbye to one of our parents, relocated two of them into new living situations, and cleaned out three houses. Professionally, my boss up and quit in December. I, I, look, he called it retirement. He assured us that March of, was plenty notice to know. But in the end, okay, he retired. And that has thrust me in my work and the staff I serve with into transition. 
you here at ELPC find yourself in a similar spot, nine months into a pastoral transition. And I have been, for the last seven years, working with congregations in transition. But also, for the entire duration of my ministry, I've been working with people in transition. And this morning, I want to reflect a little bit on this idea of transition, and specifically, what Moses' farewell speech has to teach us. One of the central figures, if not the central figure of the Old Testament, is Moses. Moses is my Old Testament hero, and Deuteronomy is my favorite Old Testament book. If you ask most people what their favorite Old Testament book was, Deuteronomy doesn't make that list. But here's the thing is, Moses is my hero, and I'll give you the short version. In Exodus 4, God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to be my spokesperson to Pharaoh. And Moses says, that's a bad idea. I have a speech impediment. You need to find somebody else. And as a kid, I spent a lot of time in speech therapy. And when someone first approached me when I was in college about going into ministry, I said, yeah, bad idea. I have a speech impediment. Then I read Exodus 4 and found out that excuse doesn't fly with God, and here I am. So now you understand, now you understand why Moses is my hero, because he's the reason I'm standing here. But here's what I love about Moses. Moses has served 40 years with these people. And no matter how much of the Old Testament you know, it doesn't matter. Here's all you need to know. They weren't easy years. They were rough. Man's 120 years old at this point. He's ready for retirement, and we really can't blame him. But here at the end of Deuteronomy, we have Moses giving his last instructions, his final words, his final chance to tell his people who he has walked with and loved for 40 years what it is that he believes they need to know. And this is what he tells them. The first thing he tells them and drives it home over and over and over again is this. God goes before you. God charts the course. He does not in this passage say, okay, I've done it all I can. Good luck. It's up to you. He reminds them over and over and over again that God charts the course. We believe that this is still true for the church today. We do not believe that we imagine our own mission, our own purpose in the world, but we believe that God has shown that to us. A mission of redemption, a mission of justice in the world, a mission of being God's people. This doesn't change. It didn't change from, the t from that time. It doesn't change today. God charts our course. Now this doesn't, for a moment, devalue the importance of human leadership. It doesn't, for a moment, devalue our role in responding. But we need to be very clear about this. Our role is a role of response to what God is already up to. What Moses was reminding the people of Israel was that they were going to a place that God was calling them. And that God would, in fact, go before them. The assurance of this is that this is freeing for us to know that we are not ultimately in charge, but rather we are following after the one who calls us. So with that in mind, with this idea that, that we are God's people and that God is going ahead of us, how do we navigate transition well? Well, I think there's, there's two things. The first is to keep on keeping on. Let me explain. When the family matriarch passes away, you have to make a decision about what to do with Thanksgiving dinner. And the truth is, if you want the tradition to continue, someone has to learn to make the mashed potatoes, right? Someone has to step up. Someone has to do it. If you want to keep being God's people, keep doing the things that God's people do. I can tell you this without any hesitation or qualification. I've worked with over 30 churches in transition. The ones who emerge from transition the strongest are the ones who keep on doing what God's people do. The churches that survive transition who emerge stronger are the ones who continue to gather together and worship, continue to be creative, continue to imagine, create, and continue to wonder about what God is calling them for. 
their people continue in worship attendance, in financial giving, in participation in fellowship. Because see, I know people, I've been a people for 42 years, and I've worked with a lot of people, and there is a temptation in the midst of pastoral transition to sit back and to stand back and wait and see. And I can tell you, this will not serve you or your church well. It only creates a pattern of where you will be less involved and less engaged. Some people say to me, well, I go to such and such church, but we don't, we don't have a pastor right now. We're going we're gonna to kind of take a wait and see attitude. And I understand that. Believe me, I understand it. But here's the thing. The church is only the collective personality of those who participate. And when you pull back, when you step back, ELPC becomes less than it can be and less than God is calling it to be. So in this season, I would invite you to lean in. And I'm going to invite you, but then I'm also going to push a little harder here. You know, one of the things you don't find in this passage, one of the things you don't find is any qualification as to what God's people are to do. Moses does not say, hey, if you like Joshua, keep doing the things that God calls you to do. That's not there. I've looked. Moses says, do the things that God has called you to do, and, and here is your new leader. He reminds them that no matter who is in charge, no matter who is in charge, God's call remains the same. So the first thing is in transition, we need to keep on keeping on. But the second is an openness. An openness. What do I mean by openness? One of the key parts of this passage is the transition in leadership from Moses to Joshua. I mean, literally, this is how I would translate the passage. At the end of his speech, Moses called up Joshua, shook his hand and said, good luck, buddy. I'm done, and walked off stage and left Joshua standing there in front of the people. I don't know if that's exactly how it happened, but that's how I imagine it in my head. But what he didn't say was the following. Now, don't worry, people. Now that Joshua's here, nothing's going to change. It's all going to be the same. Don't worry. He didn't say that. Whenever there's a change, whenever there's a change, change itself is inevitable. Whenever leadership changes, change is inevitable. Now, your congregation is interesting because pastoral transition, labeled with global pandemic, has made for a really interesting season in the life of the church. The question before you all, as members and participants and friends of ELPC, is not whether change will happen. You've already seen change happen. It's whether you will resist it or be open to it. For the Hebrew people, it was all about to change. New homeland, walk through a river again, all kinds of crazy stuff was about to go down. They didn't really have a choice. But the question for you is the same. As you face this next chapter in the life and ministry of ELPC, are you going to resist the change because it's new and it's challenging? Or are you going to be open to the change? I need to confess something to all of you. I think I'm hard to work with. Let me explain. I have had a whopping total of three positions in ministry in my entire life. The first one, my boss quit a month after I got there. The second time around, my boss quit after six months of me being there. And now after six years. This one really doesn't count. But I think the story I most want to share with you and where I've learned the most about this comes from the second time that this happened to me. When I graduated from seminary, I accepted a call to Hampton Presbyterian Church, and I was delighted, so excited to go. There was an experienced senior pastor, there was another associate who I knew well, and I really looked forward to the three of us working together. So I get to the church, and I am just enjoying and loving life. And in October... The other associate pastor says, I'm going to leave. I've got a new position. Now, we anticipated that one coming. Like that one we knew was coming. No big deal. No problem. Six weeks later, the senior pastor is like, oh, by the way, I need to talk to you later after staff meeting. Could you stop by my office? Sure. I walk in. He's like, so I'm leaving. 
you now understand that I went from being the junior pastoral staff member to the senior in six months. Now that was stress-inducing enough. Oh, did I mention we had a million and a half dollar building project that was going on? Did I mention that in the middle of that, the building contractor went out of business? With the job 50% done and 90% of the profit in his pocket? Oh, and did I mention, did I mention that two weeks after I found out that my boss was leaving, we found out we were expecting our first child? No, it wasn't a stressful year at all. But I got through it. So what did I learn? I learned a couple things. The first lesson I learned the hard way. At the first session meeting, after all this went down, the, our new interim pastor was there, and I was delighted. The problem is the session kept looking at me and not him. They kept looking at me. And afterwards, I talked to our interim pastor, and I was like, why do they keep looking at me? He's like, because I'm not going to be here very long. You are. You need to step up and lead in this season. And in the back of my head, I said, but I'm just the youth guy. And he said, not anymore, you're not. So three things that I learned. Number one, I reflected long and hard on this. Did I believe God had called me to this church in this season? The answer was yes. The answer was yes. I had interviewed with a number of churches, and this was the one that within the first half an hour of the interview, I knew was the fit. So yes, I absolutely believed that God had called me to that church for that time. My question for you today is, do you believe that God has called you all to ELPC at this time? My hope and prayer is the answer is yes. And if you believe that, if you believe that God has called you to ELPC in this season and this time, then here's what I did second. I remained faithful. Terrified, but faithful, I kept going to work. I kept preaching. I kept writing lessons. I kept going to committee meetings. I kept encouraging and supporting people. And you know what? I stepped up and did a lot of stuff I hadn't planned on doing. Lots of hospital visits, a couple funerals, and a very heated meeting with a banker. Through it all, I learned a lot. And here was the thing I want you to understand. What I learned, and perhaps the thing that stuck with me the most, was that, you know what? This challenge, as hard as it was, taught me an awful lot. So if you believe that God has called you all to ELPC in this season, I would encourage you to remain faithful. Keep doing the things that you are called to do, and you know what? Try out a few new things. Next time Patrice or Heather or Sarah calls you, say yes. Even before they ask, just say whatever it is. I'll do it. It's a fun game. You should, really should try it. You never know what you might end up doing. That's the, right? Be open to new things, both as a congregation as a whole, but also for you in your individual practice. And finally, and this was the hardest one, I had to be open to a new reality. So I know there are people who like change, Probably some of you like change. I don't like change. I'm a stability type of guy. But what I had to do, and this was the most important thing, I had to accept the fact that the role, the work that I had envisioned at that church was not going to be what it was going to be in the future. The reality that I was stepping into had fundamentally and forever changed. Going back wasn't an option because back didn't even exist anymore. This was the hardest thing for me, but it was the most important. What I want you all to hear very clearly is that March of 2020 forever changed the church. We will never, ever be the same. The pre-COVID world is gone, and that includes for the life of the church. The realities of our past are exactly that. They are realities of the past. But here's the thing. In the midst of changes in leadership, you, as collectively as a congregation and as individuals, have an opportunity to grow and to learn new things. And out of the best transitions, we emerge stronger, more focused, and more confident in who we are and what it is that God is calling us to do. 
The reason I ended up at that church was that my predecessor had a very rough, rough tenure. And in the gap between the time that he left and I arrived, a committed group of about five parents stepped up to do their best to lead the youth program. And when I got there, this exhausted group of five parents looked at me and said, it wasn't much, it wasn't very good, but we did our best. Good luck. The truth is, they had done an exceptional job. They had done an exceptional job. And my ministry was stronger for it. If, you're, if you are sitting, waiting to see what the next pastor of ELPC will do to get involved, to engage, well, trust me, that's not what your next pastor wants you to be doing. Your next pastor wants the people of ELPC to be actively engaged, imagining, creating, dreaming, inspiring, learning, and growing, so that when that person arrives, they jump onto a moving train. Every pastor in the room will tell you this, that we rather show up to a church that has been active and alive and moving forward than one that is sitting back and waiting. Sure, times of transition for any congregation are challenging. I will never deny that. But the question is simply this. Is this season for you as a congregation a problem to be solved or an opportunity to be engaged? It is my hope and it is my prayer that this next season for you as an individual and well and as a church is a season for you to be reshaped and to grow, to imagine where God is leading you in the future, knowing that it is God who owns the future. It is God who is calling us into the future. It is God whose victory is sure. Knowing that, it is my prayer that you will keep on keeping on and be open to all that God has done, is doing, and will do. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are your people you have named us and claimed us in the waters of baptism and call us to put our faith and trust in you to go where it is that you lead us. Lord, give us that courage. Make us attentive to your spirit and be with these saints as they await what it is that you are calling them to. May they be, be attentive to that spirit and faithful to your call of redemption and justice in our world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.